Now breeding peppers is really quite straightforward. Pedigree selection has been used more often than not for the development of many inbred lines and cultivars as well as F1 hybrid cultivars. Mass selection has probably been commonly used with the land race types that are that are popular in certain parts of the world where open pollinated seed is still utilized. But you can use both recurrent selection and back cross methods to integrate genetic variation and important traits of interest and enhance genetic variation in your population. And this, this really should be done more, particularly in such a self-pollinating crop. The physiology of the plant is usually a bush less than a meter tall. There are some exceptions, and if they grow as a perennial for many years, they can obviously exceed that size. Generation time can be quite short for most species, between 90 and 140 days, so multiple cycles per year can be made breeding this crop. The first flowers may occur just 40 days after germination and will continue for the life of the plant in a somewhat indeterminate fashion. And the plant may live for 10 years or more, usually doesn't because diseases might take it out, but it can in certain environments. The mating systems would include self-pollinating progenies for open pollinated cultivars, which has been very common up until the last 15 years or so, all were peppers were open pollinated cultivars. Outcrossing rates are generally not very high, usually less than 5%. There are some instances and some types of peppers where that has been documented to be extremely high, largely due probably to exerted stamens and also a certain kind of bee that's a more effective pollinator than the honey bee. Um, for F1 hybrid cultivar production, manual emasculations and male sterility are utilized by the industry. Male sterility in peppers is not as effective as in other crops or has not been utilized as much as in other crops, largely because it's fairly easy to generate seed by manual emasculations where labor is inexpensive. There's a genic uh, sterility that's one recessive gene and it's very stable. And there's cytoplasmic male sterility, which is there are several different genes identified. It's not as stable and is sometimes temperature sensitive. However, it is used commonly in Korea to generate hybrids. Honeybees don't really favor pepper pollen, so for using sterility systems, it might be necessary to find other species of bees, maybe bumblebees or other mechanisms for pollen uh, dispersal. The seeds of peppers are somewhat delicate, more so than tomatoes and eggplants. They have a shelf life of less than two years at room temperature. However, they can be stored uh, at minus 20 for greater than 15 years if they're sealed, prickly vacuum packed. Uh, the numbers range from 10 to 300 for fruit. So this really impacts the efficacy of producing pepper seed and the amount of plants necessary and how expensive the seed will ultimately be. The most seed is produced in bells and the large sweet types, and the least will be produced in some of the smaller fruited types like habanero and tabasco. The variation in seed size is dramatic. Uh, bell and jalapeno tend to have larger seeds, the largest. Habanero tends to have fairly small seed, and some of the wild species, chacoense, cardinaceae, some wild habaneros, some wild bacatums, have very small seed, even half the size of, of the habanero seed seen here. When it comes to determining what we want to breed for, what are the important traits, as you may have gathered from the previous sl slides and the many pictures of peppers I've shown, for thousands of years, appearance, size, and fruit quality have been the main attributes that have been bred for and selected by, uh, by agriculturalists and now by plant breeders. Color, of course, has been, because of the range of colors, has been very important. And then, of course, yield is important, but very, very uh, sensitive to the environment. There's a large impact of the environment and fertility regimes and the soil on the yield of peppers. So it certainly should be selected for, but it will be sensitive to the production location. More and more so in the last 20 years, or maybe even 40 years, disease resistance has become a crucial component of breeding in peppers because it is stricken or subject to a lot of different pathogens and pests. Early maturity is also very important in some locations, particularly for fresh market peppers where the early peppers demand higher prices. Then plant habit and stress tolerance is something 
that I've worked on, that my predecessors worked on, and it's becoming more important to adapt to different cultivation systems and to deal with issues like water shortages and rising temperatures or, or declining temperatures depending on your location. Flesh morphology is important to consider, particularly for fresh market, but also for processing peppers. Too much moisture means more expense to remove that moisture when you have to make chili powder. So high dry matter is preferred in drying peppers, whereas more moisture and thickness of the meso mesocarp is preferred in something like a jalapeno or a bell pepper. Firmness, which is controlled to some degree by the S gene, is very important in fresh market peppers, less so in processing peppers. The mushiness character or softness character caused by the dominant allele is not very desirable for fresh market peppers at all. When it comes to color, of course, the Y gene leads to yellow or orange colored fruit as opposed to the dominant allele of this gene, which would lead to red colored fruit. And then the SW1 recessive allele would lead to sulfury white or really lack of carotenoid pigments. Phytochemical content is becoming more important aspect of many vegetable breeding programs and also agronomic crops because we're coming to understand that food can also be a, a, t a type of medicine and really important for our health. So in peppers, it's a good place to start. As a vegetable, they tend to have a lot of beneficial phytochemical content. Um, they're replete with ascorbic acid, uh, phenolic compounds in the form of flavonoids, we have capsaicin, which itself has health benefits, and carotenoids, which are known to have health benefits, and peppers are one of the best sources of many carotenoids. The T and B genes in, in pepper have been linked to higher carotenoids, particularly beta carotene. On the right, the small pepper is one we've discovered through screening germplasm that is remarkably high in flavonoids in excess of 500 parts per million. So is much or more than an onion in the case of compounds like quercetin. So we're using, utilizing that in our breeding program and I think that could lead to peppers with much higher antioxidant and flavonoid contents. And just taking something out of our breeding program, a, a line that we've increased the levels of flavonoids dramatically over typical commercial types. And our goal is to create commercial, rep, uh, replicate some commercial varieties but integrate the genes that lead to high levels of these uh, compounds, and particularly quercetin and luteolin as flavonoids and vitamin C, which is an important antioxidant that everybody needs to have. Moving away from that and into diseases, it's very important that we consider where we're going to grow peppers. They're very sensitive to the environment particularly as it relates to disease. In humid climates, they're quite sensitive to a range of bacterial and fungal pathogens. And they're also quite susceptible to insects which vector serious viruses. Bacterial leaf spot has probably been the most studied disease in peppers, certainly from a genetic standpoint. They've identified seven resistance genes to date. All uh, five of these are dominant hypersensitive type reactions, a gene for gene type of response. Two of them provide more of a horizontal resistance, race nonspecific, which might be more durable over the long term because the pathogen may be less inclined to overcome this resistance because the pathogen survives just at a low level. doesn't cause economic damage. To date, at least 10 races of this pathogen have been identified. Insect vectored viruses are another serious problem with peppers, particularly here in Texas and Florida and in other subtropical regions. Spotted wilt is common throughout the range of pepper production, even into the cooler areas in Europe, and it's vectored by thrips. Uh, tobacco etch virus and other podiviruses, pepper model virus and PVY are vectored by aphids and are severe problems in, in peppers, particularly during early stages of growth if infection occurs, the, the crop is lost. And then the Gemini viruses are more common in the tropical climates, extreme southern Texas, southern Florida, and Mexico, spread by white flies and devastating to the pepper crop. It usually leads to almost 100% loss of the crop. And then curly top virus is another uh, bagamovirus um, that is 
vectored by leafhoppers and is common in New Mexico, West Texas, and California. And in some years when leafhopper numbers are great, uh, it becomes a serious problem and crop losses can approach 50 percent. So from the beginning, breeders recognized the need to find virus resistance in the germplasm and identify the inheritance. And results of this were pretty positive. There's been numerous potivirus resistance genes described. They're now named using the PVR nomenclature. Most, but not all, most of are single recessive genes. We've experimented with pyramiding some of these genes together and found that we were able to enhance the level of resistance and also the resistance to multiple strains of some of these pathogens like pepper model virus and tobacco etch virus. Dabamoviruses have been common in many crops and of course they infect peppers. They're mechanically transmitted and can be spread by human touch and on seeds which is, is a serious problem in peppers. There have been four dominant alleles of genes described, L1 through L4, and to date, L4 has been effective against all of the, of the strains of the virus until recently, in the last few years, uh, this resistance has been broken as well. So the search continues for more durable resistance. Against the tomato spotted wilt virus, there's a single dominant gene from Capsicum genens which also has been broken in, in, in many locations in the world by uh, resistance breaking strains. However, it's still utilized quite a bit in the industry and it's certainly better than having no resistance at all. Unfortunately, no R genes have been characterized against the begamoviruses and we sorely need them. There have been reports in the literature of resistant germplasm, but nobody's characterized if it's actually genetic uh, due to an R gene or if it's something to do with the vector. It's not, it's not clear, but certainly more research needs to be done it as these viruses spread and as the vectors become more common. Fungal diseases also are a serious plague on peppers. In some regions, they're the most important problem, particularly if you have soil infested with Phytophthora capsici, which is very common in New Mexico, parts of California, in Mexico proper, and now in parts of Florida and Georgia. When you have this, you don't get rid of it from your soil. It's a very uh, persistent organism. It's able to form uh, spores that last in the soil a long time and then when they become activated with sufficient moisture they will rapidly infect and cause decline of the crop. If there is enough rainfall they will also infect the pods and the leaves. Powdery mildew is spread through airborne spores. Lovulula torica is the, is the species that infects pepper. It's very common in greenhouses and also in, in cool, moist climates. In parts of California, it can be devastating to bell peppers. Nematodes are a serious problem in many parts of the world on many crops, and pepper are not an exception. This picture was taken in, in Mexico, and you can see the dramatic effect of a part of the field where they did not fumigate against nematodes, the stunted plants. Fortunately, there is a nematode resistance gene. It's a single dominant gene, the N gene, first described from Santaka cultivar, but it's also in many other lines. It's been bred into Carolina Wonder and True Heart Pimento and other hot peppers, such as Charleston Hot and Nematador from New Mexico State. There's also a single dominant gene in Capsicum chinense, bred into cultivars such as Tiger Paw. Um, the inheritance also it appears to be a single gene, but it hasn't been characterized or allelism tests have not been done to, to determine whether or not it's the same as the N gene, which is in Capscom annual. As I've already started to mention, resistance genes have been characterized for many of the diseases in pepper, but not all. In powdery mildew, there are several reports of multiple dominant genes. Most of them have not been named. This is mostly a problem in capsicum annuum and continues to be a big problem in greenhouse culture. Many of the wild species, Futessens, Chinens, and Picatum, don't get powdery mildew or very rarely do. They're naturally highly resistant. Phytophthora is a problem on any species of pepper and it can be a problem in any region. Fortunately, multiple dominant genes have been described in these particular germplasm accessions. However, there has been a great deal of linkage drag experience in trying to enter 
progress these genes into useful types. There are now useful capsicum annuum cultivars with resistance, but it's still not the level of resistance that exists in the wild types. In our own lab, we've examined and characterized resistance that's recessive from another source. It is, unfortunately, two recessive genes make it a lot more difficult to breed with. However, we have not yet encountered any linkage drag when introducing these genes into chili or Anaheim type peppers. Now peppers are notorious for their spiciness. Very few other crops, an exception would be black pepper and horseradish, can provide this type of piquancy in the cuisine and that's why they become the most popular spice in the world. However, capsaicin is not something to be trifled with and can be very irritating to some people. It is it is not water soluble, so you can't get rid of the sensation by drinking water. Uh, the best way to get rid of it is to drink a dairy product or eat ice cream because it's fat soluble. It will penetrate the skin and it's actually used in analgesics and pain therapy medications. It's also now been being used in cancer research because it has the capacity apparently to inhibit some tumor cells. It does for in particular for some people lead to the release of morphine-like endorphins and so it's said that people who become accustomed to eating hot peppers can't stop eating them. This might be due to the mild euphoria that results from that. It, it has also become common in, in some cultures to use peppers as uh, a folk remedy for certain uh, ailments. They're, they're also considered to be a crop or a food that brings a hot sensation uh, like a ginseng or other other herbals. All of these things should be considered and also if you have issues with stomach like, such as acid reflux, uh, it should be considered before consuming peppers because they can in, they can induce that problem in certain individuals. Nonetheless I think they will continue to be the most important crop spice in the world and we really have the Native Americans to thank for that because long before uh, the New World was discovered by Columbus, the Native Americans had been cultivating and breeding and selecting the different species of peppers probably for about 7,000 years. That concludes what I have to say and I hope you've enjoyed learning about hot peppers.